Well, hey there, Cove Church. So great to be with you today. Uh, you know, I was talking with my, my friend and mentor, Don Bryan, this week, and he mentioned to me a scripture that I thought really um, was, was a word for us as a church, maybe to the entire church as a whole around the world, but certainly to us as a church. And it was, it was from Luke chapter 21. And if you read Luke 21, the first part of that chapter, it's all about everything bad that's happening and political things that are going bad and relational things that are going bad, everything kind of the world in crisis. The end of the chapter is the same kind of stuff. Everything's kind of falling apart. It's a big mess. But sandwiched right in the middle is this one verse, and it's Luke 21, 15, and it says, For I will give you words and wisdom that none of your adversaries will be able to resist or contradict. It's, it's a promise from God to us that God wants to give us in this time what to do and what to say. And that, that sandwich right in the midst of everything else that's going on, all these difficulties, all these struggles, that's where it appears in that scripture, but it's also how it appears in our life. That whatever you're walking through today, whatever struggle you're walking through today, right in the midst of that, God wants to give you what to do and what to say. And it's with that I would love to lead us as we start today in a, a word of prayer. Let's pray together. Jesus, that is your promise to us, and we receive that promise in this moment, that you want to give us in this time, whatever the difficulty we're walking through, you want to give us what to do and what to say. So we lean on you. We seek you today for that, God, knowing that even out of great difficulty, you can bring about great good. We love you. It's in Jesus' name. And everybody said, amen. I'm not a morning person. Uh, I never have been. I think it's because I was born at like 11.42 in the morning, as my mom tells me. Um, it doesn't mean I don't do early stuff. I, in fact, a lot of my normal week is scheduled with early morning meetings, but I never feel like I'm really at my best until about 11 in the morning. And I'm usually at my best until about 1.30 in the afternoon. It's a very small window of productivity. <laughs> but that's where I really feel like, man, I'm, I'm doing great right in that two and a half hours. And it sort, sort of declines after that. But even though I have all these meetings in the morning that are early and I don't feel my best, on my days off, I will often want to sleep in. And that is absolutely true with one exception, going fishing. Oh, if I'm going fishing, it can never be too early for me. 4.30 a.m., 5 o'clock a.m., no big deal to meet up with a friend, drive through the darkness to meet up at the river. It's so early, but I never mind those early mornings. I think of those hot beverages and worn-out thermoses, uh, watching the, the first light break over foggy valleys and snowy peaks the rumble of truck tires on pavement, the scent of wading boots and wet dogs. Even though at times the drive might be close to two hours, it, it never ever feels that way to me, really because of one word, anticipation. The conversation is always filled with the, the what ifs and, and the what could be's of the day, and it's peppered with the stories of what was before, but all of it points ahead to these yet unseen possibilities that the day may hold for us. Now the drive home, on the other hand, it, it may feel a little longer depending on how things went, but the drive there to the fishing spot, it never feels long. It, it's as though those possibilities, they carry you as you roll across desert plains, they, they galvanize you as you barrel through whatever stands between you and your destination. Because the hope of what will come outweighs any hardship along the way. That is one of the images that is brought to mind when we talk about this idea of Lent. Lent refers to the 40 days leading up to Easter week. It begins with Ash Wednesday, which for us this year is February 17th. It is an intentional journey across the desert of life, knowing that it will end with the greatest celebration imaginable, with Easter Sunday, with Resurrection Sunday. 
And just as Christ's road to the resurrection was filled with struggle and sacrifice and prayer and process, Lent invites us to the same. To seize this opportunity to bring about a greater closeness to God by walking where God walked. Now let me give you a, a bit of context. I, I've never done Lent before. In fact, until this series, I didn't really have a clear view of what Lent was. And some of you may have the same feeling, same experience. Now, some of you may be way ahead of me. Perhaps you, you grew up in a Catholic background or, or more of a mainline church background. I had none of those things. Not only was I not raised in church, but the churches that I have been a part of since meeting Jesus, they, they didn't really participate in Lent. Uh, they weren't anti-Lent, don't get me wrong. It, it just wasn't how we did things. It, maybe it was, uh, for them, a rejection of, of some church stuff that was tied to how they grew up, or maybe it felt like uh, a religious exercise. So things like certain liturgies and Lent were basically, for me, just not included in my church experience. Easter, absolutely, but Lent, not so much. And so throughout my life, the only preparation that I knew about when it came to Easter was getting a new outfit, right? That's what you do. You get the new outfit. Maybe you plan an Easter egg hunt. You plan a brunch. That was the preparation that went into Easter. Now, some of my friends would even go jackrabbit hunting on Easter weekend because of the Easter bunny. You know how that works. But that was all I knew of Easter preparation. And Lent was not even really considered. Yet Lent, it actually invites us to something more. It invites us to this deep, heart-level preparation to celebrate the greatest event in human history, the resurrection of Jesus. That's what it points to. And so if your history is anything like mine, it's possible that we have essentially proclaimed the end of the story being Easter Sunday, without fully engaging all that it took to get there. And Lent is actually what helps us experience that part of the story, really the backstory. It reminds me there is an elderly couple, they were traveling through the south of England. Now in England, roads are labeled, uh, usually like uh, if it's an arterial street, it's gonna say A7 or A15, that's how they're gonna name the road. So they're traveling on a road called A2 and they're going very, very slow. So the police officer pulls them over and goes up to the gentleman and says, well, can you tell me why you're driving so slow? He says, well, officer, it's, it's A2, it's two miles per hour, so I was going two miles per hour. The officer says, no, you don't understand. That's the name of the road that you're on. That's this highway that you're on. The, the actual speed limit is 70 miles per hour. You gotta speed it up. It's really dangerous to go that slow. And so the elderly man thanked him and said, you betcha, I'll speed it up. Sorry, I didn't know that. As the police officer was leaving, he noticed that the, the wife of this gentleman was sitting in the front seat. She hadn't said a word, and she was just ghostly pale. There was sweat dripping down her face. She was just gripping her seatbelt, staring straight ahead. So he came back, and he asked the gentleman, hey, is, is everything okay with your wife? Is, is she all right? And the gentleman looked up at the officer and said, oh, don't worry about her. We just got off of A259. <laughs> See, sometimes you got to hear the backstory to get the truth of what's really happening. The, sometimes the story that we're living in that moment doesn't inform us of everything that led up to it. And the truth about Easter is that without experiencing kind of the backstory of Lent, it's possible we miss some keys. These places in Lent, where we engage concepts that have brought meaning and depth to the church for hundreds of years. There are truths and gems of relationship with God that are wrapped up in this journey of anticipation that we call Lent. Gems, really, that can change our lives. And it's those gems that we hope to seek out in this series. Now, the first two weeks of this series is gonna be kind of a primer setting up for the start 
of the Lenten season with our Ash Wednesday service, bringing us through this journey and ultimately concluding with this grand finale of Easter. Now, the general idea around Lent is this. It is the concept of baptism spirituality, meaning this. Lent invites me to die to certain things in the physical in order to make way for life in the spiritual. It's a season, these 40 days, that invites us all to a greater focus on prayer and on meditation and on fasting, on God's word, where we choose to give up some things of this world in order to posture ourselves to grow in God's world. It's not legalism, it's not asceticism, it's not somehow punishing ourselves to earn God's love. No, it's an intentional laying down of some temporal things in order to grow in eternal things. That just as Jesus died in order to defeat death itself, we trample down death by dying to self. So Lent then becomes this journey much like a journey through a desert that not only grows us along the journey, but makes the destination of Easter that much more meaningful because we understand all that Jesus did to get us there. That we will never fully appreciate Resurrection Sunday until we have lived a bit of Good Friday. Lent leads us in that. And if I can get just really practical for a moment, if there is anything that we need in the days that stand before us, it is a hunger and a desperation for God. This is what we need. These are the days that we've got to draw close to him. We can't do this halfway. And so Lent is a vehicle to help us do that. So I just want to invite you to fully engage with us in this. There, there will be along the way prayer cards and opportunities to gather and additional times of worship. I want to invite you to dive in. Let, let's grow together as we step into what has been called the bright sadness of Lent. And today our focus is on that breathless anticipation that Lent invites us to. That by embracing the difficult, we can actually experience a greater joy on the other side. And we see that in every aspect of life, don't we? I mean, that's not new to us. It's, it's the same with the student that is going through so much hard work and study in order to prepare for a career down the road. It's the same with the marathon runner who puts in a whole bunch of miles before that event. It's the same with the weightlifter who pushes their muscles to failure in order to grow stronger that we do something hard to gain something great. That is the purpose of Lent. So in that, our scripture today comes from the book of Romans. We are gonna read it all together and then we're gonna break this scripture down. So let's start with reading this all together. Big voices, ready, go. May the God of hope fill you with all joy and peace in believing so that by the power of the Holy Spirit, you may abound in hope. Here's the first thing I would point out from that scripture. The desert of Lent calls us to a renewed faith. Romans 15, 13, right there that we read, the first part of it says, may the God of hope fill you with all joy and peace in believing. Joy and peace is found in believing is what we're told. This for us is an invitation to walk in faith. Faith begins with believing what God is saying so I can then experience what God is doing. Yet too often, I want to see before I believe. I want to see it before I believe it. But faith invites us to do the hard work of believing first. I mean, seeing's easy, isn't it? When you get to the end and God shows up and it's all so clear, it's like, oh, that's what you were doing. Oh, that's the easy part. But believing before that happens, that's what's hard. That, but it's right there that we have this opportunity to experience peace and joy, regardless of what we see. 
And if there is any season that we should lean into that idea, it is this one. Believing that even in the midst of a pandemic and of politics and of problems, that God is still working. That God is still drawing people to himself. And in doing so, he invites us to take steps that we've never taken before. To do things that maybe are a little bit out of the norm for us because we're responding in faith. Reminds me of another story. There was a, a nun, she was making her rounds. She worked in the, the healthcare field and she was making her rounds and she ends up running out of gas. But uh, the good news is there was a gas station just a couple blocks down the road. She could see it there. So she walked down to the gas station, asked the folks there if she could borrow a gas can, put some fuel in it so she can take it back to her car. But the person working there said, oh, I'm so sorry, I just loaned out the only gas can that we have. You could wait around for it, I'm sure it's coming back, but right now I don't have any, anything to give you. Uh, but the nun said, oh, you know, I'm kind of on a schedule, I'll, I'll figure something out. She walked back to her car, and she's a very ingenious person. She starts looking through her car, potential uh, things to carry gas in, and she finds a bedpan that she was gonna use uh, for one of her clients. So she takes the bedpan, takes it back to the gas station, fills it with gas, takes it back to her car. And it's there that she's pouring out of this bedpan uh, fuel into her car that two men walk by. And one of them turns to the other one and says, would you look at that? Now that's what I call faith. <laughs> See, new growth for us will always require new steps. This is what it looks like to walk in faith. It just looks different. See, any relationship we have will remain exactly the same as long as we do the exact same things in that relationship. We only experience new things by doing new things, by walking new roads. And so God is inviting us every day to new steps with him, to believing him in new ways, to responding to him in new action. That's what God wants us to find amidst this desert known as Lent. He wants us to find a renewed faith. That's the first thing. Here's the second thing. The desert of Lent calls us to a miraculous power. The passage goes on saying, so that by the power of the Holy Spirit. Again, Lent is calling us to sacrifice the physical in order to gain the spiritual. So you'll see this as part of Lent. You'll see what people start to do that in this season, they might fast or give up certain things in their life. Uh, some examples might be giving up sugar for a season, or maybe they actually fast for seasons of not eating anything at all, or maybe they'll, they'll fast social media, something like that, because all that stuff leads to decay, obviously. Uh, and so you, there's lots of things you can fast, but those are just two examples. The point is, again, sacrificing something in the physical in order to replace it with the spiritual. So here's some examples. Uh, for me, like when I get that pang at night, if I'm, if I'm uh, wanting sugar, you know, I usually want that late at night. Around 8.15, I usually want a dessert of some type. But let's say I've decided for Lent I'm gonna fast sugar. So when I get that hunger pang for sugar at 8.15 at night, what that's going to do is it's going to drive me to prayer. My stomach's going to be like an alarm clock saying it's time to pray. That hunger you feel, this is your signal to pray. That's what it does for me. Another example, perhaps I'm fasting social media. Uh, but by habit, I just pick up my phone and I start to check it. Well, that's going to be a reminder then to look at the scripture instead, that every time I pick up my phone, I'm going to look to the scripture instead. I'm not going to look at social media. Now, those are just a couple of examples. But what the hope in all of this is for us is that I am shifting the power source of my life from man-powered living to God-powered living. That's what we're trying to do. It's like when you're learning to drive for the first time. I mean, do you remember those first trips 
when you're in the car driving. And I, I, for me, it was white knuckle grip on the steering wheel. And, and I'm adjusting like every millisecond, right? Because I, I, I'm adjusting to every pothole and every slope and every squirrel. I'm just like every moment, I don't, I don't want to hit it. I'm just, I'm just every millisecond changing things with the steering wheel. And then someone finally tells me, you know, if you just kind of look down the road to where you're going, the car is pretty much going to go straight there. You don't have to adjust at every moment. You're just going to get there. It's, it's going to go there. You don't have to be consumed with compensating for the bumps of every moment as long as you keep your eyes on the destination ahead. The same applies to our life with God. We often, we act like new drivers. We're, we're constantly relying on our own power and our own skill and trying to deal with every bump of life and every crisis and every change that comes before us. And it's exhausting, isn't it? We're just kind of white knuckling our life. And some of us feel that exhaustion right now. And we end up living this life where it feels like we're the only answer, like we're all there is, and that everything is up to us. Yet right there, Jesus reminds us like he did in Luke chapter 11, that God longs to give the Holy Spirit to those who will ask him. So will you ask him? God's Holy Spirit is a gift and yet, in our compulsion to, to drive ourselves, we often leave that gift unopened. Now, don't get me wrong, that's not to abdicate our responsibility to do something in response to faith. But it is to refuse to believe that my action is the only thing that matters. Whatever I do must be the outflow of what the Holy Spirit is doing. God actually wants to order my steps. God wants to guide my path. And I can't do that, and I can't allow God to do that when I have a death grip on the steering wheel of my own life. Action is not wrong, but man's action alone does not last. No, we are called to live in a miraculous power, which means I give up some physical things that I grip in order to have a greater grasp and trust in God's Holy Spirit. I was talking to my friend Van Clemens the other day, and he was mentioning the story of a, a missionary in India. And that missionary was working in two different villages. He would walk to those villages to, to bring the gospel and teach and do all those sorts of things. But one village, there was a landslide that actually cut off the road to get to that village, totally isolating it. There was no possible way for him to get to that village. And that landslide was there for like a year, like a really, really long time. And so that missionary elected to basically just pray for that village for that entire year. He took a, a time every day and just prayed intentionally for that village and, and for God to meet them there. Well, the miraculous result was that at the end of the year, there were far more conversions and miracles that took place in the town he was cut off from than there were in the town that he was able to physically be in. The Holy Spirit did more than he could ever do. We must remember, friends, that God's people and God's kingdom are empowered by God's Holy Spirit. And the desert of Lent calls us to that miraculous power. We can experience that today. That's the second thing. Here's the last thing. The desert of Lent calls us to an abundant hope. As the passage concludes, saying, you may abound in hope. Of the things that should bubble out, of the Christ follower's life, of the things that should mark the people of God, we see here at the top of that list is hope. As 1 Peter tells us, praise be to the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ. In his great mercy, he has given us new birth into a living hope through the resurrection of Jesus Christ 
from the dead. We know, friends, that we are surrounded by death and decay, by brokenness and corruption. It's everywhere. And we have all experienced what it is like to place our hope in those things and then see that hope die. Yet for Christ followers, we have a living hope that is found in the resurrection of Jesus from the dead. Our hope is bulletproof because it is found in Christ. No government, no pandemic, no crisis, no human problem can undo the hope that we have in Christ. This is the drive of Lent. This is the anticipation that we have that the darkness we walk through today will disappear in the light of the risen king. My, my grandma, Bellen, uh, this is my mom's mom. She, she died several years ago. Um, she was a very unique lady. She was self-made in an era where that was perhaps unusual. She was opinionated. She was elegant. Uh, she smoked long black cigarettes, and she carried them in this really fancy cigarette case. She wore furs, and her house was filled with exotic treasures procured from her world travels. She, in fact, had this entire wall in her house that was just covered with metal bells that she had collected from around the globe. <laughs> just lots of them. And, and I can only imagine what that sounded like when there was an earthquake. <laughs> All of that was, was wrapped up in being my grandma. But above all of those unique things, there's one thing I remember most about her. I remember the scent of her perfume. I still don't know the name of it, but I know I would recognize it in a moment if I smelled it again. It was a fragrance that seemed to embody all that she was. Adventure, independence, class, it's what she brought into the world, and it made an impact on me. See, friends, we've got to remember that the fragrance of the Christ follower is hope. This is what the world should experience when we come into the room above everything else and abounding hope a hope that rises above, that supports us from below, that carries us through whatever is in front of us. And the question we should all be asking ourselves today is simply this. Is the hope of Christ abounding in my life? Is that what people get when I walk into a room? Is that what people get when they talk to me? is hope the first thing. And if hope is not the first thing, well, that can change today. See, hope, I think, is often seen as a rare commodity, especially in our world. And, and so we're tempted to ration our hope. You know, people are like, well, don't be too hopeful now today. You don't want to be disappointed later. So, so don't overdo it on the hope or, or just keep that hope under wraps. You, you, want to, you want to save that. You might need it down the road. And yet we're called to a living hope, an abundant hope, a hope without an end, a hope that then drives us into the desert of Lent to see God's goodness on the other side. Because the desert of Lent calls us to an abundant hope. I'll wrap up with this. As I often reference, I grew up in central Oregon, what is known as the high desert. And I've spent a lot of my life amidst the smell of sage and the dry dust that is carried by summer winds. I've found myself surrounded by the broken terrain of lava rock and silt. And in every way, that desert is beautiful to me. So much so that I can remember being so excited 
to show Central Oregon to my wife, Paula, the first time. When we were first dating, I was going to bring her over, and she's going to meet my parents and that whole thing. But I was so excited to, to show her Central Oregon and what the high desert looked like. And I remember as we, we finally drove over, and we're going past Hoodoo, and we're going down the other side. And I turned to her, and I'm like, sweetie, this is it. This is what it looks like. Isn't it amazing? And she looked at me, and she said, it's brown. I said, I know. Isn't it great? It's just so incredible. Isn't it so beautiful? She said, it's brown. <laughs> and at first, she didn't see the beauty that I saw, at least not right away. But in time, I, I think she did. She, too, found the treasure that can only be discovered in the desert. Friends, as much as I have grown to appreciate the green of our valley, I still find myself drawn back to the call of the desert. That is the call that Lent invites us to answer. To intentionally place ourselves where God can stretch us, where God can challenge us, where God can meet us. Jesus spent 40 days in the desert. The question is, Will we follow him there? And in great anticipation, would we too find ourselves on a journey that ultimately changes how we see and then transforms who we are? With that, let's pray. Cove Church, thanks again so much for joining us for our service today. We hope that this has been a great kickoff into our understanding as we walk through Lent and journey through the desert together. As you go and as we conclude, there's going to be some discussion questions that come up on the screen. This is a great opportunity to delve deeper and further apply what we've learned today. And so with that, again, thank you so much for joining us. And we hope you're able to join us next week as we continue our journey through the desert. Take care.